Hello everyone. I wanted to record a brief lecture on the canon of the New Testament. Uh, this lecture will be followed by a lecture on the text of the New Testament. And there are two different kinds of methodologies and criticisms at getting at what the New Testament is. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how the New Testament was copied and how we can look at all the thousands of documents and read them in Greek and look at how in the process of being copied over hundreds of years, small mistakes crept into the New Testament. And so before we can even begin to interpret the New Testament, scholars have to look at the New Testament and try to understand how it was copied over the ages and how we can understand it and the various documents that are part of it word by word, line by line. This lecture, on the other hand, talks about what the New Testament is in terms of how it came to be collected and used by Christian communities. The first thing we have to realize is that the New Testament was not written all as one book, but was originally circulated as probably 27 separate documents before they were collected into the New Testament and used by the early church. The study of how this occurs is called canon criticism, or trying to understand how the New Testament came to be as a collection. The word canon in Greek has twofold meaning. In one sense, it can mean a rule, like literally a ruler, right? By which one measures things. And it comes to have then this other sense of a rule of faith, and then applied to these documents, that these documents are the rule of faith. And so when we try to understand the process of canonization in the New Testament, we are trying to understand how these separate individual documents circulated among the communities and then how they were collected and then came to be regarded by the early Christian communities as their rule of faith, as their scripture with all the authority and power that pertains to scripture. Now, as we look at the earliest believers, those who were in Paul's congregation, those who followed Jesus even, we know that for them their primary scripture was collected in the books of the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms. For Jesus and his followers they probably were uh, reading Aramaic and Hebrew texts. For Paul and his followers they seem to be reading the Greek New Testament, the Septuagint. And so we see collections, the Torah, the first five books of the uh, Old Testament, the prophets, which we talked about, the former or latter prophets, and even the Psalms were collected by the time that Jesus uh, lived and that Paul uh, traveled and, and taught. But each of the New Testament documents, as I claimed earlier, was written individually for various communities and for various purposes. And we'll talk about the reasons why each of these documents was written for their historical audience. That'll be a big part of our interpretation this semester, is trying to understand, okay, if Paul was writing to a certain community that was dealing with a certain issue, maybe that influenced the way that he wrote and the theology that he presents to them. Just like you, if you're speaking to a certain community, would say some things theologically to one community, but then accent your theologically different to a community that is experiencing something different. You wouldn't preach the same theology or theological sermon to an audience that is undergoing a loss, that is undergoing a funeral. There you would want to bring a theology of comfort, but then there might be times when that congregation is so hurting or maybe challenging and pushing things so much in a negative way that you need to come with prophecy and call them out. 
Those are two different aspects of the theological work that we do, and so we find that in the New Testament documents, there are many different contexts and many different ways of speaking to these individuals and these communities. And so when Paul, for example, wrote his letters, he has a very different character in writing to the Thessalonians as when he writes to the Corinthians. Now we believe that even Paul's earliest communities began to collect his letters. They copied them, they kept them for their own communities, and then began to exchange them. And we, we think that probably by the late first century, Paul's letters were the first to be collected into a document. And we, 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 we know this because of the order in which they are. They tend to be longer. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and so on, and then they get shorter as Paul's canon, as the Paul's letters, um, as we move through Paul's letters, in terms of the order in which they are. What that suggests to us is probably they were collected at some point and circulated, because you would copy the long documents first and then the shorter documents as you added to the collection. And so we think probably by the late first century, at least Paul's letters were collected and exchanged and copied among the early Christian communities. As we move into the early church, we have multiple different kinds of opinions regarding uh, the New Testament and the collection of documents that uh, were part of the New Testament. Papias, the bishop of Hierapolis, seems to be aware of Mark and maybe Matthew. We're not quite sure what the other document is that he's referring to. He calls it the Gospel of the Hebrews. We think it's probably Matthew. And he is very skeptical as to their value. If he's writing around 110, he says that he would prefer to hear the people who knew the first and second generation. He would prefer to invite evangelists and witnesses into uh, his congregation who would have known the first generation followers or second generation uh, people who knew the first generation followers of, of Jesus or of Paul rather than reading about it. He'd rather hear about Jesus from first and second uh, testimony, eyewitness and, 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 and their followers. So we, we see in Papias' attitude as he's writing about Mark and, and, and Matthew that he doesn't seem to attach scriptural value, although he's familiar that these documents have been written. Justin Martyr, too, is uh, familiar with a couple of the Gospels and, and, and seems to be using them, but, but also has a historical perspective. Only by around 170, when Tatian compiles his gospel, which is what's called the Dia Tesseron. And the Dia Tesseron was a compilation of all four of the gospels. Only by then do we find that the gospels are probably valuable enough that the early church is beginning to use them, and, and Tatian is somehow bothered by the fact that there are differences in each of the gospels. And so he came through, and he basically wrote one single gospel out of the four, because he was bothered by the differences. It's really not until 180 that Irenaeus basically states that really there's only four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's no others that he considers canonical, and only these are valuable for the formation of faith. Uh, 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 although he doesn't call them canon, that's a very canonical statement. So really, not until 180 are early Christians viewing the Gospels, anyway, as Scripture. Justin Martyr thought they were great interesting historical works, but not necessarily scripture for the faith. Only until around 180 do we find that they are considered the gospel. We also have, as we move forward, the first sort of list of the New Testament canon. The Meritorian list has all 27 documents, plus a few others. That's also around the late 2nd century, so 180, 190, early 3rd century, around 210, 
Origen at this same time begins to talk about a New Testament. He's the first one to use this word, although he's not referring it to the, the Gospels. He's talking about what Jesus brought as a New Testament. Only Athanasius in 367 is the first to use the word canon in the sense of the list, and he really is the first to have basically affirm the collection that we have more or less now, the 27 documents. I think he has an extra one in there too, but, 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 but only by around the mid to late 4th century does Athanasius start to use the word canon in relationship to this collection of documents. So it took, from the time that they were written, as much as 150 to 200, 250 Ah, maybe even 300 years until the church, the early church, recognized the canon of the New Testament. And what that means is that they collected these documents and selected other documents that they did not wish to collect. And they used only the documents that we're, mostly, only the documents that we're using and viewed them as canonical. Some of the books had a little bit of trouble getting into the canon. Hebrews did, Revelation did, uh, but we find that by 367 it's fairly stable. Now why? Why did the early church decide to collect these documents and use them as its canon? Why, why did they did, do that? Well first off, we see Papias is still using eyewitnesses or second-hand accounts, third-hand accounts, and he still believes that those are valuable. It's more important to hear from someone than to uh, read a document. So even into the early part of the second century, they were depending upon oral sources, but that ran out. And at a certain point, those sources were becoming less and less reliable, and they had to then grasp to written sources to understand their history and their theology. Then also, each of these various Christian communities probably needed to hear some of the theology that was in these texts, and so they would read them and find them comforting. And, and we know that in terms of the meetings of the early church, they were very similar to that of the synagogue, they would come together and they would read uh, the Greek New Testament, they would Old Testament, they would read the Torah, they would read the prophets, they would read the Psalms as part of worship, and then we think probably they began at some point to read Paul, to read the Gospels, and, and found them as inspiring as the Old Testament stories. So these three factors led to the formation of the New Testament, the intrinsic factors. There were outside forces as well. Marcion, for example, was a what we would call a heretic, but others would call him a different kind of Christian. Uh, by the mid-second century, he was making decisions about what his congregation should read and shouldn't read. And he had a real problem with the Old Testament. He said that they shouldn't read the Old Testament. And really, in terms of the Gospel, only Luke and portions of Paul would he read. And, and even with Luke, it was something that he had gone through and vetted and taken out any references to uh, the Hebrew God. The Gnostics, Montanists, and other uh, diver diverse movements, they proclaimed other Gospels. They had other texts that they were reading. And as the New Test as the early Christian communities came into came to real, realize who they were, they began to reject some of these other interpretations of Jesus' life, the Gnostic uh, Gospels and the Gnostic interpretations, the Montanist, who who had sort of more of a spiritual way of doing things and said you can't really rely on any authority it's all the spirit uh, they had problems with them you know they said no we do have some scriptural authority and so by the second mid second and early third century you needed to have some works you could fall back on some written documents that you could fall back on to defend against others who were saying hey this is this gospel we've got from Thomas it's, it's just as good as that gospel you've got from Mark
But then in reading it, the early church had to say, no, no, that, that takes us too far astray from what we understand Jesus actually taught us. Right? So they began to make decisions in terms of what they would exclude as well as what they would include. The criteria for canon canonicity, if you can call, it's not like they said, oh, we're going to have these criteria, but really why the church kept these documents, first off, there had to be some connection to the apostolic era. They had to be old. They had to be connected to at least the earliest eyewitnesses, somehow, some way. Catholicity with a small c, they had to be used all throughout the entire church. If the Western church was using a document that the Eastern church wasn't using and vice versa, that document didn't make it in. And that's probably why Hebrews and, and Revelation had some difficulties, because they were read at different poor, in different parts of the empire and then eventually had to be, they, they were included and read by the other churches. Orthodoxy, in other words, the, can, the, the, the church, in terms of its understanding of theology, the documents had to affirm uh, that understanding of the, uh, of the theology and usage. It had to be used. Now, interestingly enough, the church did not use inspiration as a, can a criteria for canon. They didn't say, oh, only these writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's a very modern thing. That's a 20th century uh, uh, criterion that that fundamentalists have, have um, applied to the New Testament. Th that's not how the early church thought. They thought the early, the the spirit was moving through their communities anyway. Uh, so they didn't say, oh, well, you know, Peter was inspired, but, you know, Thomas wasn't. I mean, that wasn't what they, they didn't use that. In fact, Montanus was the one who was using inspiration as a criterion for canonicity, was criterion for theological truth. And they were rejecting that because, because really they wanted to, to grasp at tradition. It had to have been traditionally used back to the apostolic era. That was what was important, the words dating back to that period. Okay, this is just a brief lecture on how the New Testament uh, was collected and, and who collected the New Testament, how they collected it and why they collected it, and how it came to be a collection. Uh, I hope you'll join me here in a bit for how do we know what to read? in terms of the New Testament. What is the New Testament in terms of its textual history? Thank you.